Katie, this is your reporting. It is shocking in an era when the blueprint for a coup is something that was described by Republican Adam Kinzinger and just about every detail that has become public since that label was slapped on it details a very meticulously plotted and planned coup attempt. This was the piece that the Justice Department was to carry out in that architecture, and in the end, they refused. Explain. Sure. So to your point, there was something happening across the administration where pressure was being placed upon officials in several different places to do something that would delegitimize President Biden's win and that would allow President Trump to continue to hold on to power at least for several months as the you know, public faith in the election was thrown into disarray, as people stopped believing the results and you know, as, as chaos would ensue. At the Justice Department, it's clear from the transcripts of interviews from the Senate Judiciary Committee that were released today, the officials felt this pressure. They felt that the former president wanted them to legitimize these claims, either by announcing investigations that would have supported the idea that massive amounts of fraud should undermine our faith in the election, or by taking investigative steps, by sending letters that contained things that officials knew to be untrue in order to overturn the election. And they felt that their word, the word of the Justice Department, would hold weight because clearly Trump felt that way too. And so the pressure campaign that we see from what is the most detailed and fulsome account yet from the Senate Judiciary Committee is startling because you really do start to get the sense of the full pressure that was on. Let me read what the report reveals about the instances in which Trump applied this pressure you're describing. On December 15th, there was an Oval Office meeting with Rosen and Donahue. On December 23rd, there was a call, the Trump-Rosen call. On the 24th, the Trump-Rosen call. On the 27th, I believe those are the notes that the Judiciary Committee has released uh, prior to today's report, um, a Trump-Rosen-Donahue call. December 28th, a Trump-Donahue call. December 30th, a Trump-Rosen call. December 31st, an Oval Office meeting with Rosen and Donahue. January 3rd. Oval Office meeting, including Rosen and Donahue. January 3rd, the Trump-Donahue call. On January 4th, um, John Eastman's in the Oval Office presenting this plan. I mean, what Clark asked the DOJ to do, John Eastman, a lawyer who wrote that blueprint for a coup attempt, which is what Kinzinger describes it as, is in there the next day. I wonder, Katie Benner, where the intersectionality is between what DOJ was supposed to do and what Eastman laid out for Pence to do. You know, it's one of the things that we also sense from the interviews and the many, many documents and emails that the committee obtained is that the Justice Department was not only being pressured by Trump, as you saw in that list of communications, also that list of communications, which was in direct violation of the White House contacts policy. <clears throat> Nobody from the White House is supposed to talk to the Justice Department about investigative steps and, and prosecutions. That is forbidden, and yet we saw that happen many times. The Justice Department was not just pushing back on pressure from the former president. Officials were pushing back on pressure from allies that came from seemingly all corners, people who Trump had started to bring into the White House as more you know, establishment voices fell out of favor with him because they did not agree with him. He started to fill those slots with, with people like Eastman, and those are the folks who were pressuring people at the Justice Department to take either investigative steps or to file legal briefs that former officials believe would have been disastrous for democracy. Um, Jonathan Lemire, there's a lot in this report about one of the flashpoints in the attempt to overturn the election result, probably the one with most public-facing evidence, and that's Georgia. I want to read from the report on Clark's letter. On December 28th, Clark emailed Rosen and Donahue a draft letter addressed to the Georgia governor, General Assembly Speaker, and Senate President Pro Tempur. The letter was titled Georgia Proof of Concept, and Clark suggested replicating it in each relevant state, so it was just a blueprint. The letter would have informed state officials that DOJ had taken notice of election irregularities in their state and recommended calling a special legislative session to evaluate those irregularities, determine who won most legal votes, and consider appointing a new slate of electors. Now, this is what I want to ask you about, Jonathan Lemire. State officials had taken notice of election irregularities. Katie Benner and her colleagues have reported that Bill Barr ran down claims of election fraud, found none that would have changed the outcome of the result. And I want to understand how close we came 
to a fraudulent letter coming out from the United States Justice Department asking for each state that was in question by Trump and his allies to throw out their results. The answer is dangerously close. There was an extraordinary amount of momentum here uh, to do just that. And we should be loath to give too much credit to people who went along with the former president's Ill, act, Ill will and actions uh, for most of his term, but at least did stand their grounds in the, in the last moment. Vice President Pence is one of them, uh, although certainly some reporting in recent books suggests he did everything he could uh, to try to do to bend to Donald Trump's wishes, only at the last minute being told, realizing, no, he cannot, uh, in part because of counsel from former Vice President Quayle. And Bill Barr is another uh, who certainly we're seeing in the reporting now uh, that, you know, he again, we know that he as much as he could supported the president throughout his term uh, and even and framed uh, so much of his arguments, particularly starting with the Mueller report um, in his first days in office. Uh, but here at the end, this was a bridge too far and he could not. Uh, so it was close. And let's also remember, of course, that there were some local officials who stood strong, including the Secretary of State in Georgia, uh, who resisted uh, call claims from the uh, calls from the president, including literally a phone call from the president, uh, one that we received, were able to listen to, thanks to the leak of remarkable audio, uh, you know, in which he, the president, was asking for a specific number of votes uh, in order to overturn the election, give him Georgia. Uh, and there was a sense that if Georgia went, so would Arizona, and that would, you know, would behave you well on its way to reclaiming a second term. So it is an extraordinary effort here in these last few days. And now we have enough distance from it to realize, though, on the face of it, it seems almost laughable and far-fetched, but really it wasn't. This was close. This was, an act this was in actuality. There was momentum to this happening. And we're lucky it didn't. And we should be careful of what happens next time around.